Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, webinar in the margins of the annual regular meeting of subscribing states to the Hague Code of Conduct. Those of you who follow us uh, or already know that we are conducting regularly a series of research and debate activities around the, the code, around proliferation issues with the support of the European Union. Today's discussion will revolve around confidence building measures and their role as we are seeing new missile technologies emerge and the question of uh, keeping up to pace with technological developments, their speed and their depth is always key when considering security issues. So I very much look forward to today's debate. And today's meeting is also for me an opportunity to extend my deep thanks to Ambassador Lagner for his support and for his commitment during this past year and to present my wishes to Ambassador Einchil as the incoming Hcock Chair. So without further ado, let me just indicate that this meeting is being held on the record. It is being recorded and the video will be posted online. Let me now yield the floor to Ambassador Meyerlein van Delen, Special Envoy for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation at the European External Action Service. Ambassador dear Marjolein, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Alexandre, for that uh, introduction. Um, excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, dear participants, first of all, let me welcome all of you and let me thank you very much for your participation in this open webinar on confidence building measures and new missile technologies in conjunction to the Hague Code of Conduct Against Ballistic Missile Proliferation. HCOG. It's a great pleasure and privilege for me to be here today and to address these introductory remarks on behalf of the European Union. The proliferation of ballistic missiles, in particular those capable of carrying weapons of mass destruction and space launch technologies, continues to be a grave concern to all of us and to international peace and security as reaffirmed in several UN Security Council resolutions. We know the challenges. More and more states own or seek to acquire technologies to produce ballistic missiles, while modern missile programs aim at achieving longer ranges, greater precision, and increased strike power. Consequently, several regions of the world are engaged in a new arms race. This creates significant uh, security risks for all and no geopolitical pressures, which is a dangerously destabilizing fact. Unfortunately, to date, there is no legally binding treaty or agreement to stop or to curb the proliferation of missiles. We must therefore maintain and strengthen the existing confidence building measures of the HCOP. And that is why we've organized today's event together with FRS to stimulate a discussion about this need and about possible ways of adapting to the changing environment. Next year, we will celebrate the 20th anniversary of the code. In those 20 years, technologies have advanced at very high speed. Policy making and confidence building don't usually evolve at such speeds and often for good reasons. Yet still we have to find ways to stay in sync with these developments. And that is why we firmly believe that today's event, which takes place in the eve of the HCOC annual regular meeting, is of particular importance. And we're therefore looking forward to listen to our distinguished speakers, as well as to the suggestions and ideas as of, as of many of you as possible. Allow me at this point to thank uh, FRS, the Foundation for, Foundation for Strategic Research, I'll say it in English this time, for the excellent collaboration and for the organization of the event. Allow me to also extend special acknowledgements to our speakers, which is a good mix of chairs of, it, of the HCOC and of research fellows. Because Ambassador Benno Lagner, of Switzerland, the chairman of the HCOP for the year 2020-2021. Uh, 
Ambassador Gustavo Antil of Argentina, the chairman of the ESCOP for 2021-2022. And then Dmitry Stefanovic uh, from the Russian Academy of Sciences. Great to have you. Tim Wright from IISS, so great to have you. And uh, Emmanuel Mertre and Alexandre Doyer at uh, FRS for, for organizing. But before I turn it to them, I want to briefly take this opportunity to mention that this event is part of the EU support for the HCOG. As you know, all EU member states have subscribed to the Hague Code of Conduct and strongly support it. One of the ways to express this support is by jointly supporting both politically and financially a big outreach program, which is implemented by FRS. For over more than a decade now, in this framework, we have help, helped raise the profile of the HCOG. We have promoted universalization through dialogue and information sharing. And for example, FRS organized outreach webinars for several geographic regions, such as Latin America, Asia, the Caribbean, Africa. They were very well attended. And again, uh, thank you, uh, Benno, for participating in these events uh, as well and to, to having this dialogue with the countries of those regions. Um, in addition, FRS has published a number of economic papers, academic and information papers on different aspects of the HCOG, which I find very uh, informative. In the European Union, we very well know that in order to get sustainable results, we have to work with our partners. Global challenges such as disarmament and non-proliferation cannot be tackled by one country or by one group of countries, like the EU alone. Cooperation and effective multilateralism are the key words that define our relations with our partners around the world. The Hay Code of Conduct is no exception to this, and we know we are joined by many. During last year's UN General Assembly, the biennial resolution in support of the HCOG was adopted with a new record number of 176 votes, so subscribing states as well as non-subscribing states which corresponds to 91% of the total UN membership. Among other things, the resolution underlines the importance of further steps in enhancing transparency and confidence building among states. And that is what we hope this event will contribute to. Well, ladies and gentlemen, allow me once again to warmly thank you for your presence today and to wish you a fruitful and interesting exchange of views. Thank you very much and back over to you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Marjolan, Ambassador van Thelen. Um, let me now turn uh, to Ambassador Benno Lagner, resident representative to the IAEA, permanent representative to the CTBTO PREPCOM of the, uh, at the permanent mission of uh, Switzerland in Vienna and chair of the HCOC for the year 2020 to 2021. So Ambassador Lagner, uh, dear Benno, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexandre, and a very warm welcome, excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be. Thank you for joining us in this webinar, which is taking place on the day before the annual meeting of the subscribing states to the Hague Code of Conduct. Let me begin by expressing my appreciation to the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique for organizing today's event and for their excellent support throughout the whole period of the Swiss chairmanship. I also wish to thank you, Marjoline, and the European Union for the great support that you have offered also by, um, by, by supporting FRS with its outreach activities and your important role in promoting the code. I have the honor of chairing the HCOC for a few more hours before I hand over to my colleague, Ambassador Gustavo Einschil from Argentina. And let me take this opportunity to wish you, Gustavo, a very successful chairmanship. Switzerland has been a subscribing state since the very beginning. We are committed to supporting global efforts to enhance international peace and security. And we are ready to assume our responsibility in this regard. Our chairmanship of the code is a manifestation of this. The code's main objective 
is to reduce the destabilizing effects of ballistic missile activities through transparency and confidence building. Initially adopted by 93 states at a conference in The Hague in November 2002, the code currently counts 143 subscribing states from all over the globe. And the 20th anniversary that has already been mentioned by Ambassador van Dalen will be an opportunity to discuss how to further strengthen the code and hopefully with even a bigger group of subscribing states. Ballistic missile activities are increasingly a concern for security globally and in many regions of the world. We see an increase in numbers, the geographical spread and the sophistication of ballistic missile systems. In the absence of a multilateral legally binding instrument regulating WMD delivery systems, the code fills an important gap in the non-proliferation architecture. It does not prohibit ballistic missile possession nor the development of ballistic missile programs, but it contains a set of principles and commitments for responsible missile related behavior. And it is the only multilateral instrument that deals with the destabilizing effect of ballistic missiles. It complements the missile technology control regime and UN Security Council Resolution 1540, which also contribute to controlling ballistic missile proliferation. While there is an increasing pressure on multilateral security arrangements, and we are witnessing an erosion of arms control, the code continues to enjoy broad support. And Ambassador van Dalen has mentioned the recent vote on the biennial resolution in the UN General Assembly with a record number of 176 UN member states voting in favor of the resolution and with fewer abstentions than ever. Even 75% of those UN member states that have not yet subscribed to the code, and that's 39 out of 52 UN member states, voted in favor of the resolution. This clearly underlines the importance that also non-subscribing states attach to the code as an instrument for international security. Subscribing states commit themselves to implement certain general measures as well as specific transparency measures. These transparency measures cover both ballistic missiles and space launch vehicles. This reflects the dual use character of technology and the fact that space launch vehicle programs could be used to conceal ballistic missile programs. It is important to underline in this context that the code does not constrain the development of space programs. It explicitly recognizes that subscribing states should not be excluded from utilizing the benefits of space for peaceful purposes. The transparency measures, essentially an annual declaration regarding ballistic missile as well as space launch vehicle programs and pre-launch notifications may sound modest, but they have an important confidence building aspect. They increase predictability and stability. And the fact that the code is a modest instrument may have the positive side effect of lowering the threshold for states to subscribe to it. States that subscribe to the code benefit from access to security relevant information and transparency provided by other states. By subscribing to the code, they can demonstrate their commitment to non-proliferation. And the annual meetings of the HCOC serve as a forum for dialogue and a platform for general policy discussions about ballistic missiles. The code is facing a number of challenges. The first challenge is promoting further universalization. There are a number of significant missile possessing countries, namely in the Middle East and Asia, that have not yet subscribed to the code. There is also the challenge of enhancing the implementation of commitments. Not all subscribing states submit their annual declarations. And finally, there is the challenge of addressing the limited scope of the code and new technologies. The code does not cover cruise missiles that play a more and more important role. And another issue are hypersonic systems. The priorities of Switzerland's chairmanship have been threefold. First, to promote the further universalization of the code by increasing its visibility and through focused outreach. 
for example, participating in webinars like the one today. Through our outreach activities, we aimed to dispel some of the misperceptions that have discouraged states from subscribing to the code. We also decided to focus outreach activities in particular on the Middle East and Asia. Second priority was to deepen contacts with the United Nations and other non-proliferation mechanisms. One of the main instruments in this regard is the UNGA resolution that has already been mentioned and which is tabled on a biennial basis. I also would like to thank FRS for organizing a webinar on the margins of the first committee and another webinar this January where we discussed the impact of these UN General Assembly resolutions. Switzerland was also considering organizing a side event on the margins of the NPT review conference, but as we all know, this conference has been postponed. Our third priority was to enhance the implementation of the code. This concerns in particular reminding subscribing states to submit their annual declarations. And as a consequence of the current pandemic, we also needed to ensure the operational con continuity of the code's activities, ensuring that an annual regular meeting could take place last year, albeit in a reduced format and with limited participation, and that the key outcome documents were adopted in a silence procedure, the press release and the chairperson summary. So dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to end by once again underlining the significance of the code for both regional and international peace and security. While we are facing the risk of a qualitative and quantitative arms race and proliferation risks in different regions of the world, the code with its focus on confidence building and mutual transparency is all the more important as a contribution to enhancing predictability and stability. And I look forward to an interesting session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Lagner Diabeno, for uh, your uh, words and uh, especially um, uh, for your chairmanship of the Hague Code of Conduct during this, uh, this past year. So this concludes uh, our introductory session. So let me now turn to uh, my colleague Emmanuel Maitre for the main session on confidence building measures and new missile technologies. Emmanuel. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Emmanuel Maitre and I'm a research fellow at the Foundation for Strategic Research. So we are uh, now going to start our discussion on the topic of the day, which is the role and pertinence of the code of conduct in the context of innovations regarding missile and launcher technologies. Um, as was uh, recalled just now, the code has several characteristics. First, it is today one of the only uh, multilateral instruments regulating ballistic missiles. Second, it is a non-proliferation agreement, but also a strategic risk protection measures as it limits the risk posed by deployed systems. As the annual regular meeting is going to open tomorrow, uh, it is essential to recall the achievements of the code and to encourage, of course, all states to uh, subscribe to it and to implement it. But it is also a good time uh, to reflect on the technical evolutions that are happening in the field of missiles and to try to assess uh, how these evolutions may affect uh, the code and ballistic proliferation more uh, generally. To evoke this subject, we are going to have a short conversation with two well-known experts of the field, uh, Timothy Wright and Dimitri Stefanovic. Uh, Timothy Wright is a research analyst and program administrator uh, for the Defense and Military Analysis Program at the IISS in London. There, he manages in, in particular the implementation of the Missile Dialogue Initiative, uh, which is of course a very uh, important program dealing with those uh, issues. Uh, his expertise is on strategic and theater range um, ballistic missiles and, and missiles in general, and his most recent uh, research encompasses strategic nuclear force modernization, South Korea's missile program, and the New START Treaty. Dimitri Stefanovic is a research fellow at the IMEMO, the Institute of World Economy and International Relations in Moscow. He's a non-resident fellow at the IFSH in Hamburg and an expert at the uh, Russian International Affairs Council. His research focuses on strategic weapons, emerging technologies and their impact on international security, strategic stability, arms control and regional security. 
I will kick off uh, the discussion by giving the floor to uh, Timothy and Dimitri. We'll have about 40, 45 minutes of discussion and then we will take up questions uh, from the audience. So you can uh, feel free as, uh, as of now to send already your, your questions in writing uh, in the Q&A uh, in the Q&A box and, and please try to make sure to send them to all speakers so we can all uh, receive the, the questions. And, and after this, uh, conversation, uh, we will uh, give the floor to Ambassador uh, Enchil for concluding uh, remarks. So to launch uh, the first segment, I will now uh, turn to our panelists and start with trying to map the major uh, technical innovations that are having or may have uh, in the future an impact on the code. And I will uh, turn to uh, Tim first. Uh, in your eyes, what are the main evolutions today, especially on the technical side, uh, which are bound to play a role uh, regarding missile proliferation and regarding the, the code of conduct. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, just before I begin, I'd just also like to say thank you to Alexander and to the FRS for organizing this excellent and timely event and uh, for extending the invitation for me to speak today. Um, I also want to express my thanks to Ambassador Van Dielen for the, uh, the warm introductory remarks, uh, to Ambassador Lagner for your excellent chairmanship of the code this year, and also to Ambassador Einchil and to wish him the well wishes uh, for his upcoming chairmanship of the code. Um, so considering what are the main evolutions, I, I think that there are three main evolutions with regards to missile technology uh, that are bound to play an important role regarding missiles in relation to the code. The first main evolution is the development and in some cases the deployment of hypersonic boost flying vehicles. China and Russia have both introduced HDBs into service, the F-17 and the avant-garde respectively. The United States also has several HGV programs underway, and Washington is aiming to introduce the US Army's variant of the common hypersonic glide body by 2023. HGV development, however, is not just limited to the nuclear weapon states. Other countries, including India, South Korea, and Japan, are also conducting research and development into HGV technology. As these nations are developing HGVs for different reasons, the way in which each state operationalizes them, including with regards to their warhead, will also be different in some cases. HGV development raises important issues concerning their potential implications broadly and also more specifically with the code. First, the development of HGVs might potentially result in arms race instabilities as competitive states attempt to develop the technology due to proliferation through imitation. Second, the characteristics of HGVs could possibly cause crisis instabilities as the systems increasingly blur the boundary between strategic and non-strategic weaponry. And thirdly, HDVs mostly conduct endo-atmospheric flight trajectories as opposed to traditional ballistic trajectories, which raises the issue of what counts as a ballistic missile system according to the code and how to address it. A second evolution is the continuing erosion of technological barriers and greater availability of technical knowledge to develop ballistic missiles, especially conventional systems between close and medium ranges, i.e. around 50 to 3,000 kilometers. The growth and maturation of Iran and North Korea's missile programs demonstrates the progress that determined non-subscribing states can make to develop ballistic missiles, despite international restrictions and sanctions. Iran and North Korea's respective missile programs both began with variants of the Scud missile family. And initially, the small quantity of missiles available and the limited range and accuracy of these systems meant that their utility and proliferation implications were initially relatively minor. However, the illicit transfers of materials, knowledge, and foreign technical assistance as well as the trade in dual purpose technologies has expedited both states' efforts to produce missiles with far greater range, accuracy, reliability, and survivability. The resultant end products from both states have since become central components of their respective strategic capabilities and deterrence and are a continuing concern for international security and non-proliferation. Technical developments, however, though are not only limited to illicit transfers of missile technology or the overspill of dual use goods, Indeed, states who subscribe to the code are continuing to make strides in national ballistic missile development efforts. Within the last week, for instance, Seoul successfully tested its first submarine launch ballistic missile, while India launched a test for a new variant of its Agni family, the Agni P. Now, India and South Korea's recent tests are useful examples leading to the third evolution in missile technologies. That improved capabilities and utilities mean that ballistic missiles are increasingly attractive options for states to possess. More states than ever possess ballistic missiles. 
IISS data, for instance, estimates that 27 states have ballistic missiles across various different range thresholds. Within the last decade, at least four states acquired ballistic missiles for the first time. Now, of the 27 states that are estimated to possess ballistic missiles, nearly half, 13, are not subscribers to the code. The number of different ballistic missile systems has also increased. IISS data estimates that there are now roughly 90 different types of ballistic missiles in service across different national armed forces. The proliferation of Bristol ballistic missiles is further evident through the number of annual test launches, which is also on the rise. The US's quadrennial ballistic and cruise missile threat report, for instance, states that around 175 non-combat ballistic missile launches occurred in 2018. This is more than double the reported number in 25, which was roughly 75. Technological evolution to the accuracy, survivability, and range of ballistic missiles have mostly driven this proliferation. And the ability to accurately strike targets at range has meant that ballistic missiles have important roles in some countries' military doctrines, for instance, China's anti-access area denial strategy or South Korea's so-called kill chain. It should be noted that some states' ballistic missiles are of questionable military utility and that there are uncertainties regarding the in-service status, in status of some countries' systems due to the age of those systems, lack of spare parts, etc and that these missiles also fit into uh, countries' uh, defense strategies. While the lowering of technical barriers and the ability for some states to develop new ballistic missiles does not rep necessarily represent an evolution in terms of new technologies being developed, as other, state, other states possessing ballistic missiles already have many of these technologies, it is meant that more nations have options to domestically develop systems that are increasingly accurate, capable of reaching longer ranges, reliable and survivable. This generally points to a worrying trend that ballistic missile proliferation is heading in the wrong direction. And coupled with this are the increasingly troubling development that some non-state actors, such as Hezbollah and Ansar Allah, not only possess, possess ballistic missiles, but they are increasingly capable of developing diverse missile arsenals with limited foreign assistance. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you very much, Tim, and for starting by giving us, giving us this broad overview of uh, the status of proliferation, the trends, um, you started uh, your, your first point uh, with uh, hypervelocity, hypersonic missiles. Um, and of course, this is emphasized a lot in the general public, among militaries, uh, in strategic documents of, of many countries and, and so forth. Uh, Dimitri, to what extent do you see uh, these technologies, those hypersonic uh, systems, the different kinds uh, that we uh, see today as a game changer or, or rather uh, an evolution? Uh, and how does it matter for our subject today? Uh, well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me, and it's a big honor to participate in this event. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the Hague Code of Ton Conduct becoming a universal instrument that will help us to reduce risks, basically. So, well, uh, I do not think that hypersonic systems themselves are definitely a game changer that uh, changes a lot. But uh, as it is an evolutionary development, there is still some possibility of eventual disruptive effects. But this will depend on volume of horizontal and vertical proliferation. So between different countries and within the militaries of uh, single countries. I have serious doubts on the truly massive proliferation of hypersonic weapons of all kinds. Well, these things are expensive to develop and to field, to deploy. But again, this can change also uh, because if this or that actor becomes, becomes too concerned about the defensive capabilities of their peers, adversaries, and neighbors in general. And in the moment, my major concern is that uh, the dynamic might reverse and will everyone first being afraid of defensive capabilities of their adversaries invest in this technology and then these adversaries or other countries become so afraid of these hypersonic weapons that they will uh, invest enormously in the new generation of defensive systems. And this uh, will undermine the penetration capabilities of so-called classic missiles. And effectively, we'll see destabilization of uh, deterrence and especially nuclear deterrence between major powers. Also, it is crucial to distinguish the effects uh, between the tactical or theater and the strategic hypersonic weapons. Actually, personally, I believe that it is probably even 
more important than the payload types, I mean, nuclear and non-nuclear, for existing and future hypersonic missiles. Uh, because the effects for theater level and for strategic level might be very different. In one case, the increased uh, penetration capability, increased deliverability, if I may, of this or that type of payload might actually uh, increase stability. And uh, we must remember that for strategic ranges that of uh, over 5,000 kilometers, uh, actually so-called hypersonic glide vehicles, they fly for a longer period of time than classic uh, re-entry vehicles or ballistic missiles. But if we speak about theater uh, effects, about tactical effects, in this case, uh, hypersonic weapons, hypersonic missiles will probably be faster, definitely faster than classic subsonic uh, land attack missile, cruise missiles. And uh, on theater level, they might change a lot. So the bottom line is, uh, it depends uh, on the optics we use to look at this issue. It is an evolution development. And uh, in the end, uh, to support strategic stability, which can be defined uh, according to the classical definition of absence of incentives for the first strike, we basically need to address all challenges, all issues that eventually might evolve into actual, uh, well, hot war, shooting war. So this is the priority, not the specific effects that hypersonic weapons might have on this dynamic. Thank you very much for reminding us the different um, missions that can be uh, given to this uh, kind of technological innovation. Um, Tim, of course, these uh, hypersonic systems can have, uh, can be used as conventional weapons, can, can also be developed as um, um, delivery vehicle for uh, nuclear weapons. In that framework, uh, to what extent do you see them have, having an impact on the international efforts today to curb the proliferation of WMD means of delivery, which is, of course, the, the core objective of the code? Thanks, Emmanuel. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, as, as Dimitri said, of course, they can be used. Uh, it depends how the state chooses to operationalize them. Uh, Russia's HTV avant garde is nuclear arms. The US is under development of common hopes on fly body. Um, the US says it will be armed with conventional warheads. Um, China's HTV the DF 17. There's a little bit of ambiguity around that because some suggest that uh, given that China places a emphasis on ambiguous dual capable missiles, for example, the, the DF 26, the DF 17 might also. Uh, be dual capable, although uh, China says that it is uh, conventional only. And just you know, briefly considering the different ways to operationalize HDBs, you know, it, it's worth briefly considering sort of the dual capability of missile systems. Um, you know, the, the term nuclear capable is sometimes used within this context. Uh, it's something of a misnomer, though. It's the selective war essentially if the selective warhead can fit underneath the missile shroud, and so long as the missile, so long as the delivery vehicle has sufficient power. Uh, to carry the weight of the warhead in the system, the missile can theoretically carry whatever warhead uh, or whatever payload the user wishes. Now, although uh, adapting conventional missiles to carry WMD payloads is a very complex process, it is technically possible. So considering this, the dual capability of many missile systems indicates the development of any new missile, whether they are novel HGVs or more traditional ballistic missiles, represents an unwelcome development in the framework of efforts to curb the proliferation of WMD means of delivery. But then turning back to HDVs, I think there are several important factors, and Dimitri touched on this as well, concerning the costs and difficulties of developing hypersonic glide vehicles that are important to reflect on when considering their potential as an evolutionary or revolutionary means of uh, delivery for WMDs. So the first factor, as Dimitri said, are the high financial costs of developing HDVs. So a recent US Government Accountability Office report, for instance, noted that Washington's various hypersonic programs were expected to cost almost $15 billion between 2015 and 2024. And by means of a uh, comparison, that amount is similar to the expected costs of the US Navy's program to develop and build 12 new Columbia-class ballistic missile submarines to replace its current Ohio-class fleets. While national programs to develop HGVs and the cost of these programs will definitely vary, the high costs associated with HD development at this time will likely for now mean that they're simply too great for many countries to afford. But it is also worth noting that collaborative programs such as the Joint Australian US Sci-Fi Project are a possible way for countries to share financial and technical costs of hypersonic development. 
Uh, the second factor is the challenge of building uh, the necessary infrastructure and test facilities for conducting research and development of HTVs. Uh, these uh, facilities, for instance, hypersonic wind tunnels, are required to stimulate the unique conditions that are experienced at hypersonic speed. And designing wind tunnels that are capable of stimulating hypersonic flows is both very difficult and also expensive, and resulting in only a limited number of countries have the expertise and resources to build these facilities. A third factor are also the significant technical barriers that are needed to overcome uh, to sustain to achieve sustained hypersonic flight. So this includes, for instance, developing advanced composites and materials that can withstand extremely high temperatures for sustained periods as the HGV maneuvers within the Earth's atmosphere, and also designing sensors and communications equipment that can receive and transmit signals that are interrupted by plasma sheets that are generated when traveling at hypersonic speeds. And as well as beyond the difficulties of operation HGVs, some of the technical characteristics of these systems are not particularly new. Some experts point out that existing technologies already compress reaction times. Almost all ballistic missiles travel at hypersonic speeds. Many missiles are already very difficult to intercept. Now, HTVs may present some complications due to, due to defenders due to unpredictable flight paths, but intercepting traditional ballistic missiles or cruise missiles is already challenging for air and missile defense systems. Indeed, some experts actually argue that HTVs might actually be vulnerable to point defenses during the terminal phase of their flight as they burn off speed every time they maneuver. As such, an HTV might not be traveling at hypersonic speeds as it approaches its target, therefore making it easier to intercept. Other systems and service already create target ambiguities as well. Maneuverable re-entry vehicles or MARVs can perform maneuvers during their flight path. So considering all these different factors and returning to the original question, one can argue that HTVs present policymakers with challenges about their possible implications for stability, deterrence, arms control, escalation, and also their applicability to existing multilateral frameworks to limit their proliferation. However, the financial and technical, the financial costs and technical challenges associated with their development might limit their proliferation, at least for now, only to a very small handful of wealthy and more determined states, which already possess an abundant means of WMD delivery. And some of these challenges uh, mean, and some of these existing, and some of these, sorry, and some of these existing means of delivery already create challenges for defenders. So unless new developments such as exponential, qualitative, and quantitative improvements in missile defenders, uh, missile defenses render more traditional means of WMD delivery obsolete, it is likely that more orthodox re-entry vehicles will continue to be the mainstay of states' means to deliver nuclear payloads. As such, HTVs could be considered to be an evolutionary development in missile technology rather than a revolutionary game changer. But this is not, however, to suggest that policymakers should not attempt to explore ways to limit their proliferation, and far from it. And if we were to consider the proliferation trends of other missile technologies, for instance, land attack cruise missiles, which once were only possessed by a very small handful of nuclear weapon states, but are now possessed by around 23 states and at least one non-state actor, and if we know, as they did with LCMs, LACMs, that future technological and financial costs to develop HTVs will decrease, it is probably quite likely that a hypersonic boost glide vehicle technology will concurrently proliferate. Thanks very much. Thank you for putting into perspective uh, these, uh, these evolutions. Uh, you referred to cruise missiles. We are going to, to get back on this uh, a little bit later. Uh, what I wanted to talk about at this stage uh, is also uh, one of the aspects of the code that uh, Ambassador Lagner uh, talked about in his introduction. We, we've been uh, referring to uh, hypersonic missiles, um, military technology so far, but the code is also interested in civilian uh, technologies as it regulates, of course, both sectors by taking into account the dual nature of many uh, launching, launching technologies uh, Dimitri, I wanted to ask you, do you see civilian technologies, civilian evolutions um, today uh, in the field of launchers, of course, that may have an impact on missile proliferation and on the way the code is, is working? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. But before I address it, I would like to build upon what was just mentioned by Timothy, that uh, the fact that, uh, well, everyone is so focused on some novel technologies like hypersonic weapons and so on, I think it is a good chance to exploit this interest, this public interest, media interest, uh, to find, uh, to look for solutions that can eventually be replicated to other types of uh, weapons of concern. So my idea is like if uh, right now, for example, like major countries are so much interested in how to address the threats of hypersonic weapons, how to introduce arms control measures, 
and find actually a way to do it, then these measures can be used for all other sorts of offensive uh, weapons. So it is just like as a side note. And about civilian technologies, well, of course there is a link, but uh, I have serious doubts that, well, civilian technology like space launch vehicles or sounding rockets can be seamlessly transferred to the military domain. But at the same time, there are quite a number of elements that can be used in both guidance, fuels, materials, all these uh, issues are more or less similar for civilian and military uses. This does not mean that they're exactly the same, but the experience gained from development of these systems can be useful bo for both uh, areas, for both worlds. But at the same time, the most important outcome uh, that can actually be a challenge for international security is that investments in development of civil rocket technology definitely lead to creation of, uh, well, airspace engineers, airspace engineering corp. So basically the system of uh, teaching people, of uh, making people learn, of laboratories, of experts, of scientists who can do this kind of development of R&D projects. And also the testing facilities, the assets for simulation and modeling, the supercomputers, the wind tunnels, engine burn stands, telemetry transmission and acquisition capabilities, radars, etc. All sorts of the things that one uh, definitely needs for civilian space program or just starting rockets or things like that. These can be used for military, for military tasks as well. Of course, it is not necessarily that uh, these capabilities will be put for military programs and employed for development of actual weapons, but uh, such investments definitely create a foundation for one, for such a program. And uh, well, I'm not in place to offer solutions and actually I can't find any solutions because obviously we cannot uh, undermine uh, the, well, uh, the fact that any country can invest in civilian uh, rocket program, civilian space program. But uh, what probably can be addressed or researched in many other formats is how actually this or that country will have a way to prove that the, their investments, their developments have a purely civilian nature. What are the signs that they a shift between civilian and military program actually occurred? Uh, again, I'm not sure that uh, there are easy solutions uh, that can be found, but this is the a topic definitely worth addressing. Thanks. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, thank you both for flagging those main evolutions, the technologies of concern, but also uh, putting them in perspective and trying to assess realistically uh, the different proliferation trends. What I would like to do now is to uh, go a little bit deeper on how the code of conduct uh, may be affected by those changes. Uh, today, the, the hate code of conduct, of course, uh, focuses on ballistic missiles capable of delivering uh, WMDs, its, its main uh, mission. Uh, but the text of the code does not give many details or definition on the systems that have to be included in the annual declarations, in the pre-launch notifications that Ambassador Lagner was uh, referring to. Um, this uh, has sometimes been uh, perceived as a, as a weakness, but it may also be seen as an opportunity to make sure that the text uh, remains adapted to technical evolutions and that states uh, declare or pre-notify objects such as uh, the um, hypersonic uh, boost vehicles we, we mentioned uh, earlier when they are relying on a ballistic booster. Uh, also, I'm thinking, for instance, of uh, anti-satellite uh, weapons. Uh, Timothy, do you think this flexibility of the code uh, is an asset today to, uh, and that it may give uh, an opportunity to states uh, to change their reporting uh, and non-proliferation non practices without major renegotiations. And we know how this may be uh, difficult politically. Uh, and, and so this flexibility may be a tool to make sure that the code is, is pertinent and can take into account so, some of the changes we have been uh, talking about. 
Sure. Uh, thanks, Emmanuel. Um, yeah, you know, as mentioned, you know, presently the code uh, does not uh, refer to any technical specifications um, to define or classify a ballistic missile capable of carrying a WMD. Um, I, I think generally the flexibility offered by an absence of an agreed definition you know, is good, but it can be a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, you know, as mentioned earlier, hypersonic boost glide vehicles travel along non-ballistic trajectories for most of their flight path. Uh, some experts have observed that states uh, might be tempted to capitalize on the lack of technical specifications in the code by trying to draw a distinction between HGVs and more traditional ballistic missiles. Obviously, that's an action that could undermine the code. But, you know, as, as, as you've mentioned, um, reaching uh, an agreement on technical definitions would almost certainly be an impossibility. Uh, the, difficulty, the difficulty encountered in other multilateral forma, uh, for us, sorry, so for instance, the second uh, in, intergovernmental panel on missiles uh, indicates the difficulties of reaching a consensus uh, given the complexity of the issues. Um, with reference to hypersonic glide vehicles, the code's flexibility does present opportunities to incorporate them, uh, especially when there is a system uh, that requires a ballistic missile for the boost phase of flight. So I think that, as you said, it, it's able to adapt quite easily to new technology, um, you know, in comparison to having sort of a, a technical experts meeting group, which would need to constantly then have to update the code. And as Ambassador Van Dulen said at the beginning, um, sometimes you know, policy making can't always keep up with technological uh, de you know, developments and evolution. And also that sometimes is for good reason. Um, and also the flexibility of the code provides the opportunity for subscribers to change the reporting, um, which allows for greater energy to be placed on ensuring better implementation and improving compliance of annual declarations and pre-launch notifi notification commitments. Um, this is a way to ensure that the code, you know, to ensure the code's pertinence. Uh, just a, a small example of this is the introduction of the, uh, the pre-filled nil form, for example. This made reporting much less burdensome, uh, especially for states which do not possess ballistic missiles or space launch vehicles, and also can have fewer administ administrative resources. Uh, benefic beneficially updating reporting practices contributes to the code's universalization. Uh, to remove possible barriers of entry to states with more limited resources to subscribe, which has certainly been a very positive step. Um, and beyond this, just thinking that states subscribing to the code are asked to exercise maximum possible restraint in the development, testing, and deployment of ballistic missiles capable of delivering WMDs very much leaves it up to the states themselves. And this open-ended language therefore provides the opportunity for subscribers to consider how they can address issues within the code but also then to try to understand and, uh, and try to sort of ease concerns of non-signatories uh, to promote greater universalization. Thanks. Thank you very much for uh, mentioning this flexibility, this adaptiveness. Um, of course, there is a level of, um, of flexibility in the code, but there is also a historical focus and this focus was on uh, the non-proliferation of ballistic missiles capable of de delivering WMDs. This is really the in the DNA of, of this instrument. Um, that, that being said, we've seen that over the years, this non-proliferation focus, of course, remains is still very important, but it has been to some extent uh, complemented uh, and, and the code has emerged also as a, a tool of nuclear and strategic risk reduction. Uh, of course, as it removes the uh, risk of misinterpretation uh, of tests. Uh, so it's a multilateral tool that builds uh, uh, on the, uh, the existing bilateral framework that existed in that sense uh, between the uh, Russian Federation and the US, still exists between Russia and China today or India and Pakistan, to this pre-notification pre as being really an important uh, nuclear uh, risk reduction uh, tool. With that in mind, of course, what is pre-notified in that framework uh, by states depend a lot on what they perceive as systems that may potentially be uh, identified uh, as, in, as an incoming uh, strategic strike. Uh, Dimitri, in that context, what are the key new types of uh, offensive systems, but also maybe uh, defensive, uh, defensive systems or even civilian technologies that you see as important to include in the scope of the code without changing its philosophy and its uh, kind of light mechanism, which is, of course, it's uh, a key asset for its attractivity, as uh, Tim mentioned. Yeah, thank you for addressing this issue. And uh, I uh, like this uh, point you've made about that currently the Hcock moves from uh, 
uh, like uh, non-pro, non-proliferation agenda to risk reduction agenda. And uh, I find it, uh, well, actually quite useful given the situation we live in. And well, uh, I think it might be even more successful in reducing risks. So, uh, well, actually, I think there are no limits for types of missile technology can be, uh, that can be addressed by mechanisms that uh, exist within the HCOG. Uh, even cruise missiles or missile interceptors, of course, anti-satellite missiles. And why I think so is basically because it is obviously not an easy task. But even uh, with conventional notifications that are being distributed by countries through like NOTAM systems or NOTMAR systems, uh, there is a lot of data being shared already. And I know people who are like who are very much into analyzing this data that is available in the open sources. And uh, I've noticed that for many of such people, it's fairly easy to uh, find out what is the type of system that will be tested this or that day or like in the window between several days. So I believe that there is definitely a way for countries who subscribe to the HCOC and for those who will probably subscribe in the future to find a way to share relevant notifications of all sorts of, uh, of uh, well, launches, including space launches that uh, they not probably concerned with themselves, but uh, with which they are concerned about mis misinterpretation of their partners. And of course, there is a lot of room for discussions and misunderstandings. And that's great that we have a platform such as HCOG just to share these concerns. So that there will be a better understanding what is actually a problem for your counterpart, for your neighbor, or for your adversary, sorry for such a harsh word. So I think there is a way to share such notifications without undermining national security and actually enhancing the international security. And uh, as a representative of academia, I'm most interested in uh, another domain of this issue is just that at least some of, uh, probably cumulative data of these notifications can be shared with the public. So it will be available for researchers and experts just to have a uh, like actual first-hand data, first-hand knowledge of uh, what is going on in this field. Because obviously we can calculate uh, uh, the notifications doing through public means. We can uh, read the statements by these that officials about number of and types of their launches in any given year. But as there is already a huge platform that uh, comprises a lot of countries who voluntarily share data, I think some part of this huge pile of data, sorry for this word, can be shared with the general audience. It will also contribute to a better understanding of, uh, well, uh, what is the purpose of the HCOC and how it contributes to the, well, international security. Thank you very, very much, Dimitri, as an academic and uh, can also very much relate to, to this uh, element. Also, I realized that uh, one of the I would say um, uh, reasons to subscribe to the code. And one of the incentives is also for states to receive these informations, which are not shared uh, in, in the public. So maybe that's uh, one reason to keep it. Uh, you, you want to, to jump in on that? Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, like in my uh, mind, there might be like a multi-tier arrangement. For example, like some level of data will be shared through the HCOG and, and some of it can be made public, but also like we have a P5 process. So within the P5, the uh, NPT nuclear weapon states can share much more substantial data about launch notifications. And of course, it doesn't mean that they will believe each other or they will immediately solve all their problems between each other. But it will demonstrate that uh, the countries are responsible actors, that they look for solutions to avoid risks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, to bounce back on the on the code today and how it may answer to future challenges, uh, Tim, you mentioned uh, one aspect which is of course very important. It's the fact that the code is a, a light instrument. Uh, it's um, built in a way that uh, it's trying not to overburden, especially states that do not have capacities. Um, do you uh, think that this feature, the uh, fact also that it's, it's a non-legally binding 
instrument, which is, as you said, also maybe a double-edged sword because uh, it means that there is no verification systems and so on. But th this aspect today in a context that we, uh, of course, know it is very uh, difficult, uh, kind of traditional arms control has uh, uh, been facing many, many challenges. Uh, this characteristic today, is it maybe an asset also uh, to adapt to the, to the future? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I think just in sort of considering some of the different evolutions that we've, we've, that we've talked about today, some of the solid evolutions, um, you know, I, I think that the, the, the way the code is constructed, and as, as we said, it being light, adaptive, flexible, and you know, being non binding, I, I think that it means that it can we can incorporate new technology relatively easily to, into the code, uh, especially ones which have sort of clear you know, ballistic missile origins, especially those that use the booster technology. Dimitri's mentioned that anti-satellite weapons, you know, of course, HDDs, as we've discussed. Um, you know, get, getting into maybe the elephant of the room and how to talk about cruise missiles. Um, you know, cruise missile proliferation, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's much more acute than ballistic missile proliferation. Um, and, you know, this proliferation trend would suggest that cruise missiles need to be included in the code. Uh, I know FRS have done some excellent work on this, looking at the difficulties of including them. Um, for example, you know, if you think of the sort of the origins of, of the code, it's uh, focused around ballistic missiles for WMD purposes. But then you could instantly say, well, a few states operate cruise missiles for WMD purposes. France do, Russia, the US do, but beyond that, and anything else. Uh, most cruise missiles, of course, have much shorter ranges than ballistic missiles. And um, that's not to say that they don't, do these shorter range systems don't have important strategic implications, uh, especially in regions where the range isn't as important, for example, in Northeast Asia or Southern Asia, where range doesn't matter as much. You don't need to be firing something with a 6,000 kilometer range when your adversary might have been several hundred kilometers away. Um, and also that the range and payload of many cruise missiles that are proliferating today make them unsuitable for WMD delivery, perhaps due to uh, choose the range, uh, so due to the, uh, the, pay the payload. Um, also, the international community does have confidence that many of the current cruise missile operators uh, not attempting to, to develop WMDs as well. And of course, many of, many of those people who are, many states which are operating cruise missiles are also bound by other international agreements and uh, treaties, uh, which make sure that of course won't happen. And finally, maybe just to point out that WMD programs are you know, much more closely associated with ballistic missiles. I think there was a saying where you see the first, you will see the second. But I don't think though that, that means that they should that necessarily they shouldn't be potentially included. I mean, as, as I said, you know, the proliferation of these systems is really great. And their continuing proliferation seems in a way to undermine the code and make it look less relevant. Of course, there is the MTCR, um, but I think as we've seen some of the chat questions where there is uh, suspicion of it, uh, where also because it's much more limited with uh, far fewer states, uh, compared to far fewer subscribing states compared to the HCOG. Um, that, uh, that, that means that it's, you know, I don't think it's able to uh, control proliferation in, in the same manner and also create confidence uh, from, from other states. Um, so, I mean, I, yeah, just, just to sort of sum up, I think, I think that it is relatively well, well uh, it, is, you know, it does have the you know, opportunity to evolve to some of these evolutions, but I think, you know, there's, there's continuing challenges. Um, and you know, I, th I think that's going to be a bit of a problem going forward. Just technology continues to rapidly develop pace, and more and more countries are, are either developing these systems themselves or are able to acquire them. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I will get back on the um, the capacity of the code to to adapt. We have a, a number of questions uh, we have received on, on this aspect as well, but I will uh, right away start with the, the first question and, and uh, um, as, uh, send it to you, uh, uh, Dimitri, because it's also on this question of cruise missiles that uh, Tim just, uh, just addressed. This is, of course, one of the main uh, questions that is often um, raised when we're talking about the, the Hague Code of Conduct, uh, the fact that it's uh, not including, of course, um, cruise missiles and as uh, uh, Tim mentioned as well, uh, we are in a situation where those systems are, are being uh, more and more uh, disseminated uh, today. Um, so, so the question of our, uh, our participant is really to, to know to what extent the Hague code could or should uh, adapt to this uh, proliferation uh, and how we could uh, conceive a broadening of the scope of the code. What is your view on this? Uh, well, 
uh, cruise missiles are definitely a challenge, and uh, the problem is uh, this is such a big a challenge that even uh, like in major arms control treaties between Russia and the US, uh, the cruise missiles are mentioned, but only as a like a, a, as a quality of uh, this or that type of strategic delivery system, not as the de delivery systems themselves. The closest we got to it was with the original start and the unilateral declarations of uh, limits on uh, sea-launched nuclear-armed cruise missiles. Uh, but this is the best we could have made on, like, on the primary track of arms control. So it's not, a, it, it's not a, an accident that uh, this is such a huge challenge and we don't have any solution so far. But at the same time, we have uh, some ways of addressing cruise missiles in the MTCR, in the Missile Technology Control Regime. But there, we re with the MTCR, we actually reached uh, another challenge. It is the borderline between uh, cruise missiles and unmanned aerial vehicles are, well, rather blurred. And then things get uh, more complicated with the introduction of so-called uh, loitering munitions or kamikaze drones, which are basically like, it's very hard to actually distinguish, properly distinguish in a legally binding matter, what is the difference between the, these three types of uh, weapon delivery, delivery platforms. There are some ways to do it, but it is a huge challenge. Uh, so I think uh, with cruise missiles and probably with other uh, novel technological systems that are of concern, uh, and judging from the experience of the ages of arms control, because at least decades of arms control that we've had, um, there is no way to start from right away limits or reductions or whatsoever. Uh, I think the first step should be transparency. So the countries should be open about their concerns and be at least to some extent open about their capabilities. We have this uh, classic issue of uh, the role of cruise missiles, especially conventional cruise missiles, again in uh, major Russia-US arms control, because the Russian position have been for some time that uh, conventionally armed cruise missiles can undermine the nuclear retaliatory capacity. And so-called strategic non-nuclear weapons, although it is a very broad, uh, uh, broad thing without actual definition, those strategic non-nuclear weapons will definitely be a part of the strategic stability dialogue that will hopefully will be launched this month after the Geneva summit between the presidents Putin and Biden. So I think the first step would, should be in any case is to engage in transparency measures. And when we have a clear understanding of uh, the concerns of our partner, of our counterparts, and we have understanding of their capabilities, then probably we can move forward towards some types of limits uh, or even reductions eventually. Because uh, again, uh, I think it is also like the history teaches us that there is always some uh, extra weapons being produced and deployed that you actually do not need for to ensure your security they're being produced and deployed just for the sake of uh, worst case scenario if you have better understanding on what's up with your counterpart if you have better understanding of the concerns and and the perceptions you do not need to waste uh, so many resources on the weapons you will never need so I think that first step should be transparency. I'm not sure it would be easy for the HCOC to like to ask for transparency on cruise missiles uh, right away, but at least hosting some side events for the participants for the subscribing states to discuss uh, their vision of the challenges of cruise missiles might be like not even not a step, but just a semi step. But it will still give the direction to move forward. Thank you very much for mentioning, uh, both of you, actually, the strategic rationale, but also the practicality of arms control negotiation, putting it back into perspective of what we uh, know has been uh, difficult in the past, possible in the past, and where we may uh, be heading in the future. I would like to, to stay a little bit on these uh, two aspects with two related questions we have uh, received. Uh, in the in the Q and A um, box, uh, one uh, participant is asking about the feasibility of changing the uh, reporting mechanism, actually the the reporting system uh, under the code. And this is exactly a little bit what we were uh, talking about: the difficulty of convincing uh, states of doing so, but also um, 
the steps that might, might uh, lead, lead to, to such um, adaptations and, and modifications of the reporting mechanism. And in parallel, another question, um, which I think could be uh, dealt uh, um, together, uh, is the idea that the code may not be touched, maybe it, its scope may be uh, preserved for the moment, because uh, of course it's, it's kind of working as it is, and maybe it may be dangerous to want to uh, modify too much its content. But on the other hand, we could, um, uh, we could uh, be inspired by its format, it, the way it's working, to create other instruments in other fields, uh, whether it is uh, space or um, HTV uh, systems, uh, cruise missiles, maybe uh, how we could maybe uh, envisage the uh, creation of, of uh, parallel systems that would have the same kind of uh, spirit as, as the code. Tim, what are your views on this? And uh, I may also uh, include in the conversation if they want to, to uh, give comment, Ambassador Lackner and, and Enchil, if you have also views on, on this. Thanks, Emmanuel. Um, on, on, on the second question, uh, the idea that the, you know, the, the code can't be touched, I mean, it, you know, it makes you think, you know, if, it, if it's not broken, don't, don't try and fix it. And, you know, in, in attempting to perhaps uh, update it or make it, make it, you know, more relevant, given the concerns that we've discussed and, and historical ones, you know, you, you, you might then, um, you know, create so many difficulties that then it, it becomes less relevant or it becomes unfeasible. Um, you know, the, the idea of se separate systems, um, I, I think while they would certainly be worthwhile, I, I think that you almost, I think we're in a position where strategic, where, where sort of the you know, relations between certain states are, are, are getting quite poor. Obviously, that would be grand if that, if that changed, but I think that the problem is, is that's, that's creating, a, you know, a great deal of distrust. And I'm given the difficulties that I mentioned earlier about even agreeing on things like technical definitions and so on, I, I think that, I, I don't want to sound like a pessimist, but I think that, it, you know, these, it would be really quite difficult. Um, I, I, I certainly would like to see those, you know, those initiatives and those endeavours, um, but I, I just wonder whether they would actually be, be feasible. But like I said, I don't think that that should, uh, should mean that the state certainly shouldn't try. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, is there any other, yeah, Ambassador Lechner, you wanted to add something? Yes, thank you, Manuel. I think one of the challenges that we have is that decision-making within the code is of course by consensus. So we, and we have divergent views on these issues. Uh, Switzerland is one of the subscribing states as has advocated for also including cruise missiles within the scope of the code. There are others, there are states that are opposed to it. Uh, we have had in the past some initiatives from some of the subscribing states to try and define better um, what needs to be covered by the pre-launch notifications, for example. But this never really received traction because there were always other subscribing states that did not want to go into these uh, details. So, so this is, this is uh, the problem we have with a, with a regime, if you like, or an instrument that is based on consensus. Now, of course, you can also take another view. You can say that the code represents not a ceiling, but it represents a floor. And nothing prevents a subscribing state from being more informative in its annual declaration. Uh, it says you have to inform about your ballistic missile and space launch vehicle programs but why not go beyond and also inform about other things so if states want to show this transparency they are free to do that we also have a provision within uh, within the code uh, and basically we've talked about the annual declarations and the pre-launch notifications we have another transparency measure, for example, also inviting countries to your launch sites. This has not been done very often, but it has been done. And there is also a provision which actually encourages subscribing states to adopt additional voluntary transparency measures. So nothing will prevent a subset of subscribing states, for example, um, going forward and saying, we will also now inform on this or that. And we already mentioned at the beginning that we will be having the 20th anniversary of the code next year. Uh, we will be starting a discussion at the annual meeting tomorrow 
uh, we, ha we have two subscribing states that have um, proposed a non-paper to have a discussion process during this anniversary year. And I think this will be an opportunity to have a discussion how we can strengthen the code. And then finally, of course, all the um, webinars that, for example, you are organizing or your research papers addressing these issues, I think have a very important input that can hopefully then also be taken up by, by some states. Thank you very much, Ambassador Enchil, you wanted to add something. Thank you. Thank you very much. On the issue of the feasibility of the exercise, uh, I have some um, uh, ideas prepared for my concluding remarks, because I think this is uh, maybe how we should close. But on, on the points raised by, by Ambassador Lagner, by Beno, for instance, Argentina between 2010 and 2015, we added an additional section in our annual report. It says other developments. Because we started or reactivated programs below 300 kilometers, but since in a region could be sensitive, we were reporting, you know, between zero and 300 or zero and 200, and there was no obligation, but this was our way to have everybody. So if you do a certain developments and you explain which are the developments and which is the, 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 the threshold of the developments, it helps to, you know, have everybody informed. So there is, I mean, it's so simple. Nobody expelled Argentina from the code because we added an additional section called other developments. It's a matter of political will. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Lechner, I would like to get back to you because we have a question precisely on what you've been uh, referring as the priorities uh, of the Swiss uh, chairmanship, uh, how to engage with Asian and Middle Eastern states uh, which are maybe critical of some of the initial developments of the code. Uh, and there was also a question especially of China and maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about this because we've been uh, engaging during this uh, chairmanship as well with the, the Chinese authorities. Yes, thank you. Well, we chose the Middle East and Asia as a, a focus for our regional outreach activities, precisely because there are significant missile possessors in these regions that have not yet subscribed to the code. Now, there are many different reasons why countries do not subscribe. Uh, we have countries that feel that it's not relevant to them because they do not have programs. We, feel, we have countries that fear that there might be an administrative burden associated with subscribing to the code. And then, of course, we have in regions like the Middle East, uh, we have a very complex geopolitical situation. And uh, it's difficult to expect countries to subscribe if, they, if their rivals or perceived rivals do not. <laughs> um, but we have tried to focus on these regions. We organized a webinar with the Geneva Center on Security Policy, uh, specifically for experts from the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, you organized an event specifically with Asian countries. Uh, I know the Missile Dialogue Initiative had a focus on Asian countries last year which was very useful. And then in the context of demarches for the UN uh, General Assembly resolution, we specifically approach countries in these regions. We had our minister write letters to his counterparts, especially in the Middle East. And we were very pleased to see that four countries from the region switched from an abstention to a positive vote on the, on the General Assembly resolution. So maybe that is the first step. Uh, of course, we then said, if you're already voting in favor of the code, why don't you subscribe? But I think that was a step too far for them to take uh, this year. But I think it's a, it, it's, it's a matter of successive chairmanships uh, addressing these countries. China is a country that has been addressed, I think, by nearly all chairmanships. Uh, we, we also had a dialogue with them. But of course, given the, the regional situation, it was very difficult for them um, but we've had, for example, a significant country in the Asian region, India, joined the code in 2016. So I think it's a matter of um, a persistent effort by successive uh, chairmanships, and especially also using the UN General Assembly resolution, which is an ideal opportunity to reach out to countries, and doing it at different levels, from the ministerial level um, down to embassies, and then, of course, what I think, as I mentioned once again, your webinars that you focus on certain regions are interesting because you bring together 
subscribing states from the region and non-subscribing states. And I think learning from the example of your peers in a region is also something that could be very helpful to um, maybe um, create the will to subscribe to the code. Thank you very much. Uh, Dimitri, earlier you mentioned that transparency could be uh, a first step, a first useful step when the political situation is extremely uh, tense and difficult. Of course, this is the, ch the case of uh, China when we talk about arms control. Uh, to what extent do you see it as, uh, I would say, important on the one hand and uh, uh, realistic on the, on the other hand to expect uh, China to get closer to a regime such, such as the uh, Hague Code of Conduct? I think it uh, really depends on explaining the benefits of uh, joining such a regime, because in the end, arms control is not something you engage in just for the sake of humanity. It's basically a tool for national for ensuring national security. And uh, I think that uh, it also it, it, it I just can only applaud the volume of outreach that is being done by the Hague Code of Conduct people for quite a while already. But uh, probably now we need more actual data that is being shared just to make a point. Because otherwise, uh, there is a very b bad and sad example of the Open Skies Treaty, which basically no one cared about for long enough uh, to make it easy for first US and later uh, Russia to withdraw from the treaty. Uh, but for the last year, there was a, a huge amount of data about the Open Skies Treaty or flights have been disclosed uh, by Russian Federation, inclu uh, including Russian Federation. And it was like uh, the, the sky didn't fall down and uh, it was uh, w welcomed by everyone to become more transparent about uh, how this or that regime actually works. So, uh, I, of course, HCOC is not an open skies treaty, and I have, uh, I, I do not think that uh, the countries will start to withdraw from the HCOC and things like that. But on the other hand, the example with the open skies shows that whenever more data is being publicly available, it always helps to make a point why this or that regime is good and useful, because otherwise. Uh, the uh, topic can be hijacked by the people who have their own agenda and who will just write on every major uh, media that how bad this regime is, uh, how it undermines national security, how it benefits uh, uh, one country and uh, is hurtful for other countries. So, yeah, my point would be that uh, China can uh, be a part of uh, HCOC. I do not see like the hurdles that will prevent it. Uh, but before that, a point should be made why it's useful. Because after all, as have been already mentioned, there is a, a space launch and ballistic missile launch identification regime between Russia and China, and it was prolonged last year, and it works. So they, it's not like Chinese do not have any idea how arms control should work in this domain. They simply need to understand why is it useful. Thank you very much. Uh, Timothy, do you want to add anything on this? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, just to echo actually what Dimitri just said, you know, the, the more data uh, shows the relevance and importance of treaties. And uh, I'm sure, of course, this has been communicated, but, you know, to the to states which are either considering or considering joining um, or, or are slightly reluctant to join. You know, the benefits of joining are the access to this data. And of course, as it was pointed out earlier, you know, that countries which it's not a it's not a ceiling it's a floor and encouraging countries to provide as much data as possible of course is, is one way to uh, to to make these non-subscribing states uh, convinced of the treaty's worth and benefit um, and i think as well that also works for some smaller countries as well which might not even be considering joining the code because they think as ambassador lagner points out why is it relevant to me um, i think you know it, it is air for us does a great job of explaining how the HCOC fits into the wider security picture as well um, on issues which might be more concerning to those countries. And, you know, of course, with its, um, with its importance on space launch vehicles uh, and the importance of you know, GPS and everything like that for certain countries, things like that are much more important than ballistic missile proliferation. So I think, you know, as FRS has done, as I'm sure so happens uh, during side events and so on, of really driving home the message of the wider sort of importance of, of uh, of the age clock is, is one way to really uh, hopefully generate support and you know as was as was said earlier in you know, the importance of successive engagement ship 
you know, chairmanship chairman's constantly uh, conducting outreach activity. And you know, India is an excellent example of uh, the country which does have a, a advanced and diverse and sophisticated ballistic missile program. Um, and it's, it's been able to, uh, it's, it's subsequently joined. So, you know, hopefully with continued successive engagement with all the other states which lie outside of the code, um, who also have similar uh, capabilities and aspirations for their ballistic missile program, but will uh, be convinced of the, uh, the benefits of joining. But uh, going back to it, I think as Dimitri said, it needs to stay relevant and staying relevant means, you know, countries providing as much data as possible. Otherwise it might just appear to be sort of a, a, a backwater the backwater agreement that becomes less and less relevant. And you know, I agree with Dimitri, I don't think you'll see countries pulling out of the HCOP. But then at that point, just I think that the uh, sort of the general enthusiasm for, for the treaty will be will be even less. And as we're dealing then with the greater, you know, greater challenges uh, in terms of uh, technology proliferating and just new technologies in general, uh, I think you'll have even less enthusiasm for trying to deal with some of the, the big problems that'll be coming up in the next uh, the next decade or so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will um, rebound, bounce back on, on what you both mentioned on, on data, uh, because we had a last question, which was uh, uh, referring to uh, what uh, open source intelligence, OSINT, uh, and other uh, open source uh, analysis in general could impact, how it could impact with uh, the PLN and the transparency mechanism that we mentioned. And, and the question was also to what extent um, these uh, new tools that we may uh, access to um, states may access to, researchers may access to, how uh, could it uh, create some kind of um, in incentives for states to make sure they report effectively under the code. Uh, and I will um, ask uh, the, the, our colleague who asked the question to, to be a little bit patient because the uh, FRS is actually going to, is working uh, with uh, Katar Sinakubiak from ELN on a paper exactly on this topic. Uh, so this could be, uh, should be published by the end of the year, but it's of course a very good point. And it is already used uh, to some extent by uh, some states uh, that are having uh, compiling those open source data. And uh, of course, we can have a lot of information today. Um, what I would say also in, uh, in closing is that um, the fact that some countries are not in uh, the code of conduct and these countries uh, actually uh, do a lot of testing and um, on which a few information are available is of course a, a loophole in the, in the systems. Um, I will bring this conversation to a close. I will thank you uh, very much our two panelists for their uh, very uh, pertinent remarks. Uh, I think we can close the, this conversation with a few observations. First, the fact that the Hague Code of Conduct has been a success story uh, contributing to international security uh, today, even if, of course, it, it should uh, strive for uh, universality. So important to um, take note of the achievement and, of course, not um, try to hurt the regime by wanting to, to make it more perfect. That's an impor important aspect. But of course, uh, it doesn't mean that we should not consider, think about how to make sure that it remain, remains uh, pertinent in the next 20 years. Uh, we, we mentioned the anniversary of the, of the code. And of course, this may include thinking about the scope, about the systems that are into it, and seeing how minor evolutions uh, while preserving the philosophy of the code may uh, um, make sure, ensure that it, it remains uh, relevant for, for the coming uh, decades. And that maybe also it is uh, taken as an inspiration for other regimes in other fields, uh, for instance, uh, space. Uh, with that, I uh, thank again our experts, our uh, participants for their very, uh, very topical uh, questions. And I will be happy to yield the floor to Ambassador uh, Gustavo Enchil from Argentina, who is going to be the new chair of the code following the uh, annual regular meeting tomorrow, and who will uh, deliver concluding remarks for our uh, session today. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank La Fondación pour la Recherche Stratégique, FRS, for the invitation to share with you some concluding remarks in this important webinar, preparing the atmosphere for our 2020, 2021 Hcoc Annual Regular Meeting. It is difficult to deny the evolution of technologies that has taken place at all levels from the moment the code was adopted and the almost unavoidable modernization of delivery systems for weapons of mass destruction since then, 
They are for, therefore, the question raised by the organizers of this event about the need to consider strengthening our ex existing framework seems at the same time legitimate and very timely. And I believe that the inter interesting and substantive presentations by our panelists and the following exchange have uh, contributed uh, as a very important step in the suggested direction of assessing the role played by the code today, uh, its adaptation to the rise of new missile technologies, and even the possibilities of negotiating new CBMs based on the experience of the code. Uh, when addressing such ambitious goal, we have to consider several layers of analysis to assess the need and the feasibility of identifying new CBMs to strengthen uh, HCOG. From a procedural perspective, the wisdom of the authors of the code led them to include in para five and the organizational aspects, some provisions relevant to the amendment of the code. From a technical point of view, I think that our event today has presented to us a number of important elements to have in mind in such direction. But these are the relatively workable angles. The creation of the code took place on solid technical grounds, but from the diplomatic point of view, it was possible due to a political process of convergence of a number of different international players around the common goal of preventing the proliferation of missiles capable of delivering weapons of mass destruction. And the dynamics of such important converging process have been nurturing the life of our community of subscribing states over almost two decades, allowing the code to expand from its original 93 subscribing states to the current and impressive figure of 143 participants in our community. At the same time, we are witnesses the fact that the number of key international players have not yet subscribed the code. The universalization of the code continues to be a key priority and significant efforts have been made and will continue to be made to reach out to those not subscribing countries. And this point of my reflection, I would like to bring to our virtual table a few questions connected, uh, connecting the topic of our events with the current moment in the life of the code and the community of states around the code. Two previous clarifications. The first one, I will de deliberately ignore the circumstantial impact of the pandemic on the potential discussion. And the second one was already raised. We all know that decisions within the framework of HCOP should be taken by consensus. That's an, an objective limitation. The first question is, if we can gather within the current level of participation and the level of internal dialogue and the organizational maturity of the code in this moment, the amount of political energy or political will among subscribing states, which is required to undertake such exercise. The second question is if we can gather such energy in such context without diverting efforts from the continuous work on the universalization of the code. The third question, and it's only four, it's only four questions. The, the third question is, if it would be advisable or wise to engage in a reform or upgrade exercise while we're still trying to attract to the code important players, would it be positive, negative, or neutral from the point of view of countries currently outside the code to see that the framework is somehow uh, reshaping. It's like, for, I mean, for the real uh, European football, you, you move the goal while they are playing. Would such internal process within the code make it more, more or less attractive to those countries who would like to have joining us? Would we be adding or not uncertainty to those perhaps currently considering the possibility? The fourth and final question I'd like to share with you today is we as subscribing state to the code are ready to recreate and renew the same atmosphere of political convergence around key objectives, the same sense of common purpose that we had in 2002 in order to create an enabling environment for HCOG to update, to update uh, our, our tools. If the question is, if we, are, if we will be ready even to, to go in that direction, even if it implies 
postponing or leaving aside for a moment other legitimate national or regional concerns which are probably connected to the discussion on missiles, but not central to the overall common endeavor to curb the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction delivery systems. That's a choice. I'm sharing with you today these questions that I consider relevant and I'm raising them in good faith, even if some of them could be could bring a kind of dilemma of chicken and egg. I must confess that I don't have uh, answers to all of them. In my personal capacity uh, and being myself an optimistic beyond logic, I would say that political will, like love in our lives, has almost unlimited power. But we are not here in personal life. We, the subscribing states, own the H. Coke. And the answer to this is in us. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Ainchil of Argentina, for these uh, concluding remarks. And uh, once again, let me renew my best uh, wishes to you as uh, you are taking over the uh, as HCOC chair. So we very much look forward to working with you uh, during the coming year. Um, we are also very grateful to Ambassador Lagner of Switzerland for his excellent chairmanship throughout uh, a year of uh, virtual meetings, but a very uh, good collaboration. Um, my thanks also to Ambassador van Delen of the EU for her continued uh, support and, uh, and commitment. I would like also to extend my thanks to our speakers and panelists and uh, to uh, all of you, dear participants, and to invite you to continue following our research and debate activities around these topics. And we look forward to welcoming you to our future events. In the meantime, I wish you a very good uh, day or very good uh, night, uh, depending on where you are in the world. So thank you very much to all.